Okay, I think everyone's finding a seat. Let's uh, let's get started. Uh, so, want to introduce uh, John Ryder. John's uh, from Data Finnovation, a fintech startup in Singapore. Thanks, John, for uh, for coming up to Thai, uh, to PyCon Thailand. Um, John's going to give a talk about uh, XPath processing in Python. If you were uh, at the earlier talk today about Scrapey, uh, should be uh, some interesting compare and contrast and, and how the things are complementary. Uh, with that, I give it to John. All right. Good afternoon. Is that that's on? Yeah. That's on. Okay. That, okay. That seems to be on. All righty. So I'm going to talk about Python using XPath and some associated XML machinery for parsing. Um, so we're going to go quickly over some basics of parsing, what parsing is, why we parse stuff, and then I'm going to give a cursory introduction to XML and XPath, just enough to kind of cover the, the subject matter here. Those are deep topics that deserve their own long talks and conferences and whatnot. Um, and then I'm going to take a few examples of how we process queries, uh, how you design something to process queries, how you parse your data, what you need to do to be able to answer simple questions from some simple examples. And then we're going to discuss navigating in a collection of parsed data. So once you've fed things in, how you work with it. And then finally concluding with some uh, examples of how you can use XPaths alongside Python to get really nice, uh, more Pythonic code than without. So Python's very well known at being great at parsing data and handling text. I think with the exception of the Unicode, encode, decode errors, it's extremely clean and easy to work with in that space. Uh, if you look, you know, search engine, best language for web scraping, data science, machine learning, all kinds of things that are primarily about data ingestion, organization, querying, ex exploration. Python's at or, or near the top of the list. Um, and it's important to say that's not just the language. It's other stuff that you have available. Ah, the contrast on this projector means that when I highlight things, it doesn't show up. OK. So uh, it's not just a standalone feature of the language. The packages that are available, and many of the talks this weekend have been about packages in Python for parsing stuff, uh, handling data, solving machine learning problems. Uh, and it seems like the combination of the Python language, syntax, design, philosophy, whatever, and the packages that are available make it a great place to, to do this kind of parsing and data processing. Okay, so parsing. Conceptually, this is just taking some input content of some sort and feeding it into your containers, your data structures, your objects, something that you can then work with. This is a really old classic problem. Uh, I mean, everyone learns to read when they're young, or everyone who learns to read learns to read when they're young. And that's parsing, right? It's not identifying what letters are what. That's some kind of image recognition problem. It's forming letters into words and sentences and grammar and all that kind of stuff. That's clearly been very heavily studied in all of human history. Uh, and then more modern in the computer sense, every compiler, interpreter, everything involving every programming language involves parsing the language to start. Forget data that you're processing. So there's a huge amount of machinery available for doing these things. Uh, there's no reason to just rely on language built-ins, which may make things convenient. There's a lot of stuff you can leverage uh, fairly easily in Python and probably in lots of other programming languages too. So go back to a few Zen of Python items here. Simple versus complex, explicit versus implicit, flat nested, uh, all this good stuff. Anyone who's written something to parse input data, a web page, uh, scraper stuff as discussed in the talk that was in this room about an hour ago, math ingestion, anybody that's looked at geolocation information, lots of times your data ingestion step involves a lot of unattractive special casing and nested for loops and things that just aren't Simple, explicit, flat, clean, pleasant. And you justify that to yourself because you just do them once, and once the data is in the system, it's fine. A lot of the time, that's really not necessary. Uh, trying to explain to someone how your parser works often just references back to the input data, and you're sort of throwing your hands up saying, the data is unattractive, my parser is unattractive, sorry. That's not really a wonderful outcome. Uh, there are better ways to do things, and easier ways to do things. OK. Brief introduction to XML. Um, so it's a, a markup language. It looks a bit like HTML. Uh, some differences in rules, not necessarily important. Uh, so you've got here an example for a, a piece of fruit, what it's called, what its color is, uh, its price. Uh, anyone who's familiar with any web development seen enough HTML to, to get the concept of what's going on there. Uh, what's important is that there are more formal rules here 
So a web browser handles broken HTML gracefully, whereas your XML needs to be correct. And because of that requirement for correctness and strict grammars and, and formats, we can do a lot of interesting, powerful things quickly. So one of those things that develops from the formality is this uh, XPath, which is a language for referencing XML objects, uh, for querying into documents. So you've got data in a tree. So if we look here at our very simple example, we've got fruit as our outer layer, and then there's a couple of tags, one down. So this is a tree, fruit, it's got three children, name, color, price. And we can reference that stuff similar to traditional directory structures here with slash separators and wildcard stuff. So normal HTML type tag, image source equals whatever. So here we can write uh, wildcard, image, attribute, source, and we'll get a value back out. Uh, so there's no splitting lists and searching for greater than and less than signs and tag values. This is just a, a reference to XML independent of any programming language, you know, other than XPath, uh, for what that, what that value means. There's little helper functions here. So we see the text function down at the bottom. That's saying in some A tag what the contents of the tag are. Uh, there's a lot of other helpers like this. Um, and navigation, because as I said before, we've got something like a tree fruit and then children underneath it, we can navigate. So we can go up and down levels. So if we're pointing already at some node in our parse tree somehow, we can use this dot dot to go back up a level. Uh, so this will take wherever we are, go up to a parent. And then this is sort of Python pseudocode-ish. Uh, we can find something based on some XPath. We can find its parent this way. We can identify ourselves. We can navigate up and down the tree. Uh, and as we're going to see later, this is a really powerful property that the Python built-ins don't have. So if you've got nested lists and dictionaries, think about how hard this is to do. Right? If someone passes you a list element and you want to find the element next to it in the list it came from, unless so they also passed you that list, you're out of luck. Right? This is something that's built in to this way of, of framing data. Uh, and alongside that text function we saw earlier, there's lots of little helpers. So contains, starts with, you can do substring manipulation within ranges. Uh, it's got the usual suspects for string ma manipulation that mirror what Python's built-in library has, that mirror what C has, that mirror basically what every string processing library does. Um, so you don't have to, you can embed a lot of this logic in your query. So this is what, every image underneath an A tag where the source begins with some, you, know, you could make it some website prefix or whatever it is. All that logic is built into here. You don't have to code any of those things uh, additionally in the wrapper. OK, so here's a, a bigger piece of data. So this is a simple HTML table. And it's, there is XHTML, which is HTML that's also valid XML. Not a lot of web pages are that, but I thought I'd work with an example most people can render in their heads. So here we've got a table. It's got a header row, uh, name, color, price. And then we've got a couple of different pieces of fruit and some information about them. OK. Assume everyone is familiar enough with HTML to know what that's supposed to look like. OK, so how would we run some queries on that using XPath? So here, we're looking for a, a price given a name. So we match the row element, uh, the data element, with the text apple. And this grabs back out the third element on that row. So we've got you know, one, two, three. We've got um, position index helper function. We can do similar stuff to pull out names for colors. Uh, we can pull out all the names down here. So these are things that, in whatever format you had this data in Python built-ins, you'd be doing some, some nesting, some recursion, some something. Here, this is just an explicit query to pull that thing out. Uh, you can get several results and names here. This is everything matching first position uh, data under a row. And then you're going to get a list back. I'm going to be a little careless about things that return first match, single match, list of matches, because it just makes the slides much less pleasant to go through. Uh, error handling is not part of presenting the concept. Uh, OK, so we run around a full query. So here I'm using the LXML package. There's a, a bunch of different Python XML packages and some partial built-ins. So we run this, and it just digests all of the input data. So these three dots here are wherever your data is supposed to be coming from. Reference whatever query, whatever path we wanted earlier. 
and then you just ask it to pull out that path, and that's it. That's uh, probably the most explicit, flattest document ingester parser handler that you can come up with. It parses the document, identifies what you want, and gives you that thing. That's very straightforward. That's as, as zen of Python as one can be. Um, so if you want to do all the matches, you have a path that's something else. Uh, there's usually a function either with an S on the end of the name or some other way of indicating you don't want first match. Exactly how this works across libraries is different. Uh, web scraping tools do it differently from XML parsers. And Again, I, I'm not going to focus too much on that. You, if you want to work with XML, pick a package and learn it. Most of the structure comes from the, the language, so these little differences in API are not important to understand the idea. Okay, so let's go back to our data before and consider if it was just raw Python. So this is a, a collection of lists, so it's a list of lists. Uh, this is not maybe the greatest way to organize the data, but it's one reasonable way to do it. How would we query for the color of a piece of fruit in this list? Well, it's very straightforward. We've got a header row we need to skip somehow. We run a for loop, we check if we're past that, match, and return the values. There's nothing wrong with this code, it's just not very short. Right? It needs to be commented, and it's pretty dependent on how this data here is set up. We could organize our data differently. Okay, this is probably cleaner. Yeah, so I think people can imagine how one goes about building a parser here. So you've got fewer for loops, searching on keys, trying to get stuff to match. Fine. Uh, again, there's nothing wrong with this, but it's not that explicit. I mean, this, with our data structure that's pretty tailored to the query, compare against this, where you're saying exactly what you want. Um, if all your developers know the XPath query language, you don't even need to comment it, because this just is what it's doing. Complicated, long, nested paths, maybe, but this stuff's not so complicated. Here, you're going to need some knowledge of the data structure that isn't apparent here at all, and isn't apparent in the, the source, the real source, source information back, back here. Uh, you're going to need to discuss document somehow the transition from the raw data to this stuff and then how this is supposed to work. It's just more, more glue that you may not need to write. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make there is the, the data structure, the parsed data structure matters a lot for how you run your queries. So XML has a rich tree-based data structure where you can enter, a, oh, this should say nodes, not notes, that's a typo. Um, nodes, attributes, values. It's a a complex structure, but it's fixed. If your data doesn't fit XML, you're not going to be able to do any of these things. Uh, the Python built-in data structures are incredibly flexible, uh, but because they don't have some of the stiffness, some of the formality to them, you end up needing to write a lot more of your own code to do these queries. So we've just seen examples where you don't need for loops because the query language will do the for loops for you. Sometimes this is good, sometimes this is bad. Depends on what problem you're looking at, uh, although I think try to convince you that it's a good idea to use this more stiff structure a lot more often than people expect. Okay, so this is a slightly more complicated web page, enough so that I'm going to try to bring it up here. Okay, so this web page, I know lots of software examples seem to involve fruit, oh, this needs to zoom in. But, uh, okay, so we've got a table, we've got an image, we've got a, a header section, a bunch of things, and some yeses and some noes. So this is a little bit richer, and we're going to run some similar queries here and think about how we can do that efficiently. Uh, so here's the screen. So this is the HTML for that. Uh, I'm not going to go through line by line, but we got a header, body section, you know, the tables in here. Again, I'm assuming people are okay-ish with HTML tags. All right. So this, ooh, the colors really wash out. Okay. Um, so this is that HTML. Uh, page, that object, uh, that document, broken out as a tree uh, the way the XML, HTML, is, uh, is structured. So our, our root node here is the HTML node, and then there's a header, title, over here we've got the body node and stuff underneath it. You can already see the usefulness of the path query language because you're just describing roots down this tree. Uh, that's a lot well, visually cleaner than thinking about roots through nested Python lists and dictionaries. Uh, and it's something that just kind of fits more cleanly into the notion of how you consume documents in general, not just HTML documents, but you know, 
people books organized with chapters and paragraphs and sentences and words. Uh, this is the way the data is kind of organized for us language-wise, uh, visually, mentally. So here's a version of that as a Python conglomeration of nested lists and dictionaries. You can do this lots of ways, and I'm not going to go into great detail as to how I've constructed this one. Uh, it's, you can do this however you want. Uh, it's not uh, fantastically clean. It's not unambiguous. This, the way XML is set up, your document maps to one tree like this. So you know that your queries are going to work the same way every time. This, you build it how you build it, and then you parse it how you parse it, and move on. Okay, so let's look at how we would do that. Uh, so let's check if Fortran, old programming language, no fruit examples, in that parsed data, in this or some other version of nested Python data, has a yes or no on its, uh, down here, on its table entries. So we're going to end up with a bunch of nested loops descending through all this stuff. Again, exactly how you've laid it out. Your loops will look something like this. We're going to be checking whether some key matches you know, the, the query value we want. And then we're going to do a little more logic underneath that to extract our answer. OK, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, that logic. Again, it's maybe not the cleanest possible thing. And it's coupled tightly to, uh, to this data structure, but it, it'll work. OK, now we could use uh, beautiful soup. Um, so this is a web scraping package, simplify things a little bit. There's lots of other thin text parsing assistance layers. So here, you'll end up searching for some kind of tag. So basically, this gives you a little bit of structure and the ability to cleave off parts of the tree. And then you're going to end up writing some kind of logic underneath it, uh, finding parents, children, matching stuff, pulling text out from adjacent entries. Uh, it's not as dependent on the raw structure as this collection of for loops. I mean. This is a lot flatter and more explicit and just looks better than this. But it's still a bit longer than, uh, than we really need. And as you probably expect, we move on to an XPath example where we say what we want, and we run it, and we get the answer straight back. So this is Python code to parse the document wherever it came from. This is the thing we want. This gets it, and this gives it back to us. There's no nesting. There's no searching. We don't care what the data structure looks like because it's, you know, this describes in the, uh, the rich language of the XML tree what our, what our data looks like. If you wanted to do this as a full web scraper, you really just end up having to add something that kicks off a browser or hooks in or a scrapey setup or whatever you want to use, grab the URL, and then run the same stuff. Run the same stuff. That's it. That's a complete web scraper for one specific web page and one specific question uh, that couldn't be I mean, it can't be any flatter because it's got no nesting. Uh, I'm not sure it could be much simpler or more explicit. Maybe you could stick the get on the end here. But uh, that's pretty clear and almost doesn't need any commenting at all. OK. So we've got these uh, attribute things at source. So this isn't just contents. What do we end up doing here? Well, again, the XPath language lets us pull out attributes really cleanly. If we use one of these helper libraries, I, I don't mean to pick on beautiful soup. It's just reasonably broadly known. We end up having to do a little bit of nesting, and it maps stuff into Python native types for us, so we end up pulling things out of a dictionary. It's not overly onerous, but it's not as clean. Uh, again, you can roll some of these things up into, into uh, one line, but not in general. Uh, we could try to do this in Python, uh, where we'd end up needing to let's go back here to the data. Pull, depending on where we put our attributes versus our values, we'd end up dereferencing stuff. And it's just going to devolve into a whole bunch of nested loops that nobody really wants to look at. So I'm not even going to bother. I, hopefully it's already clear that that's not, the, that's not a pleasant way to do things. Let's say we've got a path that's a little bit more complicated. So we've got conditions along the way. We want this tag, a tag underneath it. Well, again, totally flat here. No nesting needed. If we're using some helper libraries, not the full richness of the tree, we're going to end up with some sort of multiple searching, nesting, something's a child or something else digging. Um, here we're doing uh, recursion. We're descending through the tree recursively without writing any recursive code ourselves. Here, and if you try and do it yourself in Python, you're going to end up having to do some recursive descent, which again, isn't something you really have to do. Okay, so we've got our data structure. Uh, our stuff's been fed in. We know how to parse it with whatever our for loops or our, uh, our XPaths it is. Now we're doing something. Um, how do we point into that data structure? We don't want to pass the whole thing around all the time. Right? 
we want to pass in an element and be able to navigate from there. So as I'd said earlier, with Python dic li uh, dictionaries, lists, stuff like that, you can't reference the list that you came from. You can't get back out to the dictionary that you came from, select a different key, and go back down. That's okay. You end up building your own data structure and navigating your object hierarchy however you want to. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're working in an XML space, uh, my mouse is good. Oh, again, my if you're working in an XML space, there is a fixed tree structure that every implementation uses that you can reference into. It's, a, it's very consistent. It's very easy to, uh, to port from one implementation to another. So how does that work? We pull out using our XPath function again, something referenced by the path, and then we've got an object. And we can pass that object into functions that then pull out parents or whatever weird relatives or whatever other stuff you want, compute what you need, and return the answer. That's very straightforward. So if you want to pass the path in, you can pull it out, you can pass a path. You have to write your compute function one way or another. Uh, but this, this um, ability to pass a reference into your data structure and navigate is something that we now look at a Python example. You're going to have some kind of recursive descent, build up description of how you got there, and then your compute needs to have the thing you care about, the top of all the data, and how to get back to where you came from. And then every time you want to do your computations on adjacent nodes, you've got to start navigating up and down your data structure. That's not very pleasant and not very necessary. So quickly, we'll go through a, a dictionary here. So this is not a Python dictionary. I mean a, a dictionary with the meanings of words. So here we've got the word Google and three definitions. Two are nouns. I know it's not spelled this way for that meaning, but having more XML that explains spelling variants just makes the example too unpleasant. Um, and there's simple queries we can imagine running on this dictionary. So I mean, Google is uh, as a company is a kind of number and is a, the verb to search for stuff. So this will give us all the noun entries. Exactly what the XPath contains may not be so important. We've got two levels of conditions matching and then text. Doing that in any Python data structures discussed before, going to require some looping. You can't just dereference your way down in it. So OK, maybe our Python's unpleasant because it's a bad data structure. All right, so let's move Word up here and then reconceptualize how we're going to run our queries. Okay, our XPath changes a little bit, not a big deal. Maybe with a little work and deciding how attributes go, we can find a way to run this query just by dereferencing nested into Dixon list. Maybe for this query but probably not for other queries. With our XPath entry, we can grab a definition out, we can pass that into a function, and then we can figure out what word we came from. Python's only going to let us do that if we're passing in the word, and then we dig back through the tree, find what matched, and then unroll a couple of the for loops to figure out where we are in the overall context. Right. Whereas with XPath, that's it's really straightforward. Uh, so on the Python side, if you need to do more than just nested collections of lists and dictionaries, if you're doing things that process data at any higher scale than individual entries, you're going to end up having to build a whole bunch of stuff yourself, and you're going to have to make sure that it can handle queries you've not yet thought about. Well, that last one's really, really hard. You're unlikely to build a general purpose query language as part of another project. Whereas on XPath, you have a complete set of query objects that will let you do whatever you want, to Turing complete like, X query, XPath, XSLT. There's a bunch of associated tools. Any queries you want on that tree are implementable just by adjusting the uh, script code's the wrong phrase, but the, the strings that are the XPaths uh, without doing any further work. So we now get to, let's say we don't have HTML content. We've just got some stuff that we can dump out to JSON. If we can write this JSON to XML function right here, we've now got a full parser for our data. A little bit cheating, because you still have to write this JSON to XML function. But this little four-line function, three-line useful function, is able to convert whatever your raw data structure is in to a fully parsed tree that you can navigate. So you need to write this. There are no packages for this. There's no standard for this. Those are clearly not wonderful things. But you'll find, after you do it once or twice, that writing those converters is often so much easier than writing the object hierarchy you need for your parsed data and handling the queries through your object hierarchy, all the methods that are attached together. It's extremely explainable, right? So you're going to be writing something that transforms data from one format to another, assuming your data is reasonably well massaged to start with. That shouldn't be too bad. And then 
all your queries are just going to be running XPaths into those objects. That stuff all documents itself once your transformer is understood. You're not writing any of the query code. So it's, it's saving you a lot of that work. Uh, so we use JSON there, so I feel compelled to touch on JSON for a moment. You can do some of these things in JSON. It's fine for exchanging information, but there really is no query language and no data reference object concept. Navigating doesn't really work. Uh, it sort of works. So you can kind of do queries, and there's some non-standard query packages you can run, and maybe they work for you, maybe they don't. Maybe they don't get supported anymore, whatever it is. Uh, and similarly, for references, there are JSON reference and pointer objects. They don't really work. They're more for ensuring that the content is the same in two places, not for navigating up and down. Because again, without a real query language with the, the dot, 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 whatever concept for going up and down, it's not clear what your references and pointers would do very well. Uh, so this is a Python talk. What's the point? Well, say we've got this little table here with two entries, two events that I guess are important to most people who are here. The World Cup final, which is in about a month, and the conference we're at right now. If you feed this whole thing into an XML parser, you do your conversion, whatever's necessary, you can then pull the date string out this way, yeah? and then you can use Python for what it's good for, text manipulation, creating objects. So this is not maybe a piece of code I would defend as uh, readable overall, but it's this kind of text manipulation Python's great at. If you were pulling out blobs of paragraphs and then you wanted to use Python NLP at that point, that's great, and it's very easy and you've not wasted any time trying to write a parser that handles whatever your input data structure is. You just map it to something that exists, and then it's a one-liner. Uh, so really is often enough, unless your documents are really strange and have loops and strange recursive references. Uh, if your data can be put into a tree, you should consider just converting it to XML, running a parser, manipulating back out. Uh, that'll often save you time, and then you can focus on using Python for what it's good at, processing data more text-like stuff, not building, managing, and hunting through trees. Uh, so if I can leave you with a couple of simple lessons for anybody who parses anything. This XML stuff is not only for web content. There's lots of things that fit into this tree concept. Uh, it's worth learning at least a little bit of XPath to see if you can clean up some of your queries. Even people who use CSS selectors for things could learn a little XPath and see if that uh, makes their code look a bit better. Uh, and then consider at least feeding your stuff through an XML package. And when you find yourself six levels deep in a list dictionary recursion, maybe reconsider whether you should go learn some more XPath and try and use an XML package a little bit more. So, uh, okay, and I think we're, okay, we got a few minutes. Yeah, we're, uh, we're good on time to take a few questions. Uh, any questions for John? Uh, raise your hand, I'll grab a mic for you. All right, okay, we'll give a round of applause. Thank you, John.